yourself and your moderator for this morning's media conference. We certainly have a packed agenda this morning, so without further ado, I invite Dr. Abdul Richards to present the Clinical and Parallel Health Systems Update. Good morning, Dr. Abdul. Good morning. Richards. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to my colleagues, Dr. Hines and Dr. Lebla. We really appreciate your presence at our conference. Good morning to all members of the media. Good morning to the viewing and listening population of Trinidad and Tobago and to all those who, have, who are tuned in locally, regionally and internationally. Um, this morning, I would like to provide an update on the status of the hospitals in the parallel healthcare system with emphasis on the intensive care unit facilities and also an update as per media release 903 that was released yesterday at 4 p.m. I'll start with media release 903, um, dated 9th of November 2021. An additional 305 positive cases were confirmed and reported in the last 24 hours. This now takes the rolling average to 321. And as Dr. Hines would have indicated, we have been noticing an upward trend for the past couple of weeks. The new positive cases has taken the total number of active positive cases to 5,758 and these cases are distributed as follows. There are 5,018 persons in home self-isolation being monitored by the respective county medical officers of health. There are 30 patients in step-down facilities and 405 patients in hospital. Later in my presentation, I will discuss the significance of the number of patients in hospital, but this is the first time um, as of yesterday, that is the 9th of November, that the total number of patients in hospitals exceeded 400 persons. That trend um, was, was last seen on or about the end of June, on around June 28th. So between June 28th, and yesterday, there were under 400 persons in the nine hospitals in the parallel healthcare facility. Unfortunately, nine persons lost their lives to COVID-19. And this takes the total number of deaths to 1,794. We would like to extend our condolences and deepest sympathies to the friends, relatives, and loved ones of the deceased. The total number of persons vaccinated with a first dose of a two days regime regimen has been 620,467. Persons vaccinated with a second dose of a two dose regimen, 581,872, with 36,920 persons vaccinated under a single dose regimen. The total number of persons with a completed vaccination regimen stands at 618,792. And later in the presentation, um, Dr. Hines would share some additional information and um, reiterate the, the principles around the additional primary dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to highlight yet again that the percentage of patients in the parallel healthcare system who are not fully vaccinated continues to be high and currently 4,809 or 5,166 persons based on data from July 22nd, 2021 to October 20th, 2021. That is 93% of persons, nine out of 10 persons who have been hospitalized in the parallel healthcare system are not fully vaccinated. And we'd like to take this opportunity to remind members of the public that full vaccination um, is obtained when a person has a two-week period beyond the dose of the, the second dose of a two-dose regimen or the first dose of the Johnson & Johnson. I'd like to now provide some information on the status of the hospitals in the parallel health care system. This information is as of 8 a.m. today. And yet again, I come to you with very grave and serious news um, as relayed. And again, I'm asking and appealing all members of the population to please take heed of the information that we are sharing as we continue to see 
a significant number of persons requiring care in the parallel healthcare system. Now, the Honourable Minister would have indicated on or around September 29th and warned the public that we noted a data point where we saw an increased number of persons in the hospitals. And we monitor that data point as we do. And he did warn the population. Subsequently, Dr. Trotman, myself, Dr. Hines, the Chief Medical Officer would have all had, you know, in our press conferences, identified the situation that we were noticing and the increasing demand for intensive care unit beds in the parallel healthcare system. This morning, we have now crossed um, another um, threshold or marker between the June 28th and present, uh, sorry, as uh, up until yesterday, there were 400, there were less than 400 patients per day in the hospitals in the parallel healthcare system. Yesterday, that 400 number was crossed, there were 405, and this morning, there are 427 patients in the parallel healthcare facility. It also meant that over the last two days, our occupancy levels, and that is our overall occupancy levels, which were under 40% for 113 days consistently, was surpassed. This morning, we are at 47% occupancy, over, overall occupancy in the parallel healthcare system. And in Trinidad, we are at 49%, while in Tobago, we are at 33%. I'd like to now share some information regarding the status at the intensive care units departments in our parallel health care system. This morning, there are 52 beds out of a total of 60 beds that are currently operational and activated in Trinidad and Tobago. In Tobago, in Trinidad, in Tobago, two out of five beds are currently occupied. We continue to see a significant percentage and a significant number of unvaccinated or persons who are not fully vaccinated requiring intensive care unit level care. And this morning, out of the 52 persons in Trinidad who are in our intensive care unit, 46 of them, which is 92% of those persons, are not fully vaccinated. As of 8 a.m. this morning, there were 52 persons awaiting transfer from the Accident and Emergency Department in the traditional RHEs. 52 persons, I would like to remind everyone. This is a significant increase in numbers, even over the last week. And of those 52 persons, seven of these persons are receiving intensive care unit level care in the accident and emergencies. Patients continue to present to the accident and emergencies in a severe and critical condition. So when the ambulance is, 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 is contacted to collect these patients, they have to be placed on oxygen. And upon arrival in the accident and emergency departments, they have to start receiving, they are in receipt of intensive care unit level um, management. Of the seven persons who are currently receiving ICU level care in the accident and emergency departments this morning, all seven are not fully vaccinated. This is a consistent trend that we have noticed over the last 23 days since this increased um, number of persons accessing the ANEs has been noted and this ties into the increased number of uh, cases that we have been noticed and the increase in the ruling average. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ministry of Health, the RHA teams, our frontline doctors have all have been trying our utmost best to save lives. Every morning we speak to our doctors on the front line and they are appealing to you to please please take the ministry up on the offer of vaccinations. We are doing all in our ability to manage the increased demand for ICU beds. We have increased capacity at the accident and emergency departments to treat patients who arrive and, and who are too unstable to be transferred, even if a bed is available. We have increased the number of advanced life support ambulances um, on each shift, the actual number of ambulances that are placed on each shift. We have increased ICU bed capacity at the Coover Medical and Multi-Training Facility, the Point Fortin Hospital. 
the St. James Medical Complex. We have also added ward level beds. We have reactivated the field hospital at the Port of Spain, um, out of the Port of Spain General Hospital and at the NWRHE. We've also added beds at the St. James Medical Complex. We are trying our utmost best. But if we continue on this trend, resources will soon be expended. Vaccination is our only way forward given the presence and the established uh, presence of the data of the Delta um, variant in our communities at this point in time. I leave you this morning with the three promises of vaccination. Vaccination reduces your, um, reduces your chance of developing COVID-19 and reduces the risk of transmission. Vaccination reduces your risk of hospitalization and the need for care in an, an ICU um, or HDU setting. And vaccination saves lives. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please continue to exercise civic, social and personal responsibility by ensuring that we and those close to us are vaccinated. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. I now hand you over to Dr. Hines, who will speak on the additional primary dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you very much, Mr. Alexander. Good morning to my colleagues, Dr. Richards and Dr. LeBlanc. Good morning to members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. As we've embarked upon this uh, additional initiative, and we realize that there's still some uh, confusion, a little bit of, of ambiguity with respect to who understands what about the additional primary dose. We would like to throw that uh, that slide up that shows uh, the, the flyer that will be circulating both on social media and hopefully also in print media that walks us through this additional dosing approach. And we're going to go through it in some detail for those who have not yet heard and those who uh, did hear and require additional detail. So, first of all, the additional primary dose is the, a dose, a third dose for those who've received two doses of a two dose regimen, or a second dose where applicable for those who received their one dose of Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And this approach, the strategy targets specific individuals in high risk categories. So individuals who are already fully vaccinated with either two doses of Sinopharm, AstraZeneca or Pfizer vaccine, or the one dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may be eligible for the additional primary dose if they fall into the following categories. For the Sinopharm vaccine, all persons 60 years and over are recommended to have an additional dose three to six months after the second dose of Sinopharm. Or as soon as possible after that. Once we've passed the six months, any time after that you can... Uh, you are eligible, you should be able to go ahead and, and receive that additional dose. Because the majority of these individuals would already have been recorded in our system and we have the contact information, etc., for these individuals, we will be reaching out to those who received Sinopharm at the correct time period, the correct time interval, to schedule a vaccination appointment. So everyone shouldn't descend upon the vaccination centers at the same time. You'll be contacted to schedule a vaccination appointment for that additional primary dose. And no referral letter is required uh, because the system is going to be initiated from within the, the Ministry of Health and the RHAs. Now, in addition to that, with the Sinopharm, all persons who are either moderately or severely immunocompromised, regardless of age, will also be targeted for an additional dose, and that additional dose would be recommended to be taken from one to three months after the final dose of Sinopharm. Now, again, those individuals fall into specific categories. We went through those in some detail on uh, Monday, and today we will have some additional detailed explanation about one of those categories in particular, and that is the category of individuals on cancer treatment. Dr. LeBlanc will go into that in more detail. But those individuals who are immunocompromised, either moderately or severely, will also be contacted via their service providers because they would be generally those who are receiving treatment within the public system. Those who are not in the public system will, will have to get a referral letter from their private physician 
indicating the nature of their condition so that the uh, so that they can be scheduled for their appointment. Now that's the Sinopharm. Moving to the next category for the AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Johnson and Johnson vaccines, only individuals who are moderately to severely immunocompromised are being targeted for that additional dose at one to three months after the final dose. So the 60 and over category is only for Sinopharm. It does not apply to the AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. For AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, it is the individuals who are moderately to severely immunocompromised who will be targeted for that additional dosing. And as we said, those who are in the, pub in the care of the public health system will be contacted, and those who are not in the care of the public health system must bring a referral letter from their health care provider. Now, as we said before, some of the examples of those with uh, severe or moderate immunocompromise include persons with active cancers, and we'll go into that in more detail today, individuals who received transplants and, on, uh, and are on immunosuppressive therapy, persons with certain kinds of immunodeficiencies or conditions or processes that reduce the immunity, and one of the examples given here is those who are on chronic uh, hemodialysis, individuals who are HIV positive with CD4 counts below 200, and persons on other kinds of immunosuppressive therapy for autoimmune and other diseases, those are the individuals who are being uh, identified as moderately to severely immunocompromised. And those are the individuals who will qualify for that additional third primary dose of the AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson vaccines and the Sinopharm. So we are hoping to have made that a little clearer. Of course, we'll take questions to clarify anything that remains ambiguous. But at this point, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Alexander, who will introduce Dr. LeBlanc. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And of course, further information on the additional primary dose of the COVID-19 vaccine can be found on the Ministry of Health's website, www.health.gov.tt, and our social media pages. Now, the Ministry of Health has announced that certain categories of immunocompromised persons will need an additional primary dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. This includes persons living with cancer. We go to Dr. LeBlanc for some additional information on this recent development. Good morning. Good morning, Al. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Richards, Dr. Hines, members of the media, and members of the listening and watching public, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. COVID-19 has been with us for quite a while. As Dr. Richards has explained, we are in very serious times with this third wave, with the Delta variant. The Trinidad and Tobago Cancer Society, your national voice against cancer, is here to advocate yet again to all in the cancer community. As Dr. Hines has explained, we have a difference between a primary dose and a booster shot. Right now, we're in the primary dose phase. What does the primary dose mean? It's a third shot to people or others with compromised immune systems who likely did not get enough protection from the first round of shots. And therefore, an extra dose will help to better guard them against the COVID-19 infection. Your immune system is your army. It is your defense against all infections. We know that cancer patients who are going, undergoing active cancer treatment are, have compromised immune systems. This means you may have been fully vaccinated. However, owing to your status of being treat in treatment right now, especially with solid tumors and blood cancers, you do need an extra oomph, an extra help. And that is what this third dose is about. We plead with you to get that third shot if it's applicable. We plead with you to speak to your oncology team as they will direct you and guide you as to when it's necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we have pandemic fatigue. I know we are all getting different types of information, but the reality is that the COVID-19 pandemic is not letting up. The reality is we're seeing much more deaths. The reality is that we have measures that can help to protect us all. We have the three W's and we have the vaccination. We have vaccines available. The World Health Organization has pleaded and has now recommended, apart from vaccine equity to all countries, they've recommended the third shot to certain communities. Dr. Hines has gone through the communities that are applicable to the cancer community. 
speak to your oncologist have that discussion do not be afraid if you do what you have to do with the three w's washing your hands wearing your mask keeping your distance vaccination and getting this third shot we can we can protect you from death we can protect you from hospitalization this is your chance to actually survive this pandemic these are unprecedented times we understand that people who have comorbid conditions patients individuals everyone the man on the street we've always mentioned that you're in a high risk category so these comorbid conditions diabetes dyslipidemia or cholesterol pressure cancer yes these are comorbid conditions but they are not necessarily the same as being as having a moderate to severely compromised immune system so we ask you to speak with your practitioners if you're in doubt because having a comorbid condition does not mean necessarily that you are eligible because you you think that your immune system is compromised this third shot is for those who have a moderate to severe compromise of their immune system we can't be fearful. Apart from all these measures, it's important that we also look at the holistic aspect. Look at your diet. Look at how you're sleeping. Look at your stress coping. But most importantly, when the SOE ends, please don't take this as a free pass because you've had two shots to do whatever you want. It is time for us to be responsible and accountable for each other. It is time for us to come together as a country and as a world to beat this disease. We have the tools, let us use them. All of us in the medical fraternity, especially the doctors, we have committed to an Hippocratic Oath. We also observe something very sacred, first do no harm. We do not come here to give information to cause harm. This virus is amazing, it's novel, but it's also quite dynamic. Research is constant. We are bringing information as it's recommended by our statutory body, the WHO. Let us come together, stop the fighting, stop the discrimination. Listen to the advice and to all of us in the cancer community, remember, if you're getting radiation at this time, chemotherapy, T-cell therapy, if you have a solid tumor or a blood cancer and you're in active treatment, please note that you are eligible for the third shot. Please have that discussion with your oncologist or your team and get it done. I beg of you, please, as Dr. Richards has explained, Dr. Hines has explained, the numbers are going up. We're seeing unprecedented numbers and we are really trying our best to save lives. I thank you so much and I beg for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. LeBlanc. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move into the question and answer segment. Our media representatives are asked to state their name and the name of the media house that they represent before posing their question. Of course, because of time, we're asking that we have a maximum of two questions per media house in the first instance. And if possible, we will feel an additional question from media representatives. That is, if time permits. Our first question, um, or first, we go first to EZP News. Good morning. Good morning, Prior Bihari, EZPNews.com. My questions are of Dr. Abu Richards, um, can you give us an idea of the number of ICU beds we have at the various hospitals? For example, how many at, at Augusta, so how many at Cuba, et cetera? And secondly, the, the minister had said recently that the field hospital at the National Stadium would have been up and running. Can you say if that is up and running? And also, does that have ICU bed capacity? Thank you very much. Good morning, Priya. Thank you for your questions. I'd like to start with the second question, which was um, regarding the field hospital operations. And I can confirm that the field hospital at the port of, that is at the National Stadium out of the Northwest RHA and being managed by that RHA is operational. The capacity of that hospital would be at 28 ward level beds. And of course, the hospital was operationalized or reactivated based on the increase in demand being noted um, on a daily basis over the last three weeks or so um, in the um, Northwest RHA. Prior to this, additional ward level beds were added to the St. James Medical Complex. The field hospital, um, the po a policy decision was taken 
that the ICU and HDU levels of care would be present and would be made available at the St. James Medical Complex. So at this point in time, the field hospital is being used for ward level care. That is the least critically ill mm -hmm. and severely ill of the persons who are entering um, the accident and emergency departments. Your second question um, requires a little bit of a breakdown of the number of intensive care unit level beds in Trinidad and Tobago. I'll start with Tobago. In Tobago, there are five ICU beds that are operational at the Scarborough General Hospital in Signal Hill. And the TRHA and THA have been working to expand their ICU capacity, um, which was which the Honorable Minister spoke about at the last press conference. In Trinidad and Tobago, the following hospitals have the following bed uh, capacity um, for ICU level care at the Coover Medical and Multi Training Facility. There are 26 ICU level um, ICU beds at the Augustus Long Hospital. There are 10 ICU beds at the Arima General Hospital, 12 beds at the Point Fortin Hospital, six beds, and at the St James Medical Complex, six beds. The the need or demand for ICU beds is dynamic. I would like to remind the population that these are the beds that require the most resources in terms of equipment, staff, um, lab, lab support, and other factors. And so we are, have been, and as per the Honorable Minister's um, directive, prior to the onset of the Delta variant, we have been increasing the ICU capacity on a phase basis in line with the demand. However, if we continue on this trend, our resources will soon be expended. So I hope that brings some clarity to your question, Prior, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Uh, we go to Guardian Media Limited. Good morning. Hi, morning, everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. So both my questions are for both the Ministry of Health officials at the table there this morning. Uh, firstly, we're now seeing cases increasing. We're seeing hospitals, hospitalizations that is increasing. Um, and some people are, and ex-medical experts are suspecting this is the start or the precursor to another wave of infections. So my question is, what is being considered at the ministry and at the governmental level uh, when it comes to responding to this, with, 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 with what would be a fourth wave of infection, if it's true? I mean, we have been promoting vaccination and saying vaccination is the way to protect the population. But I mean, that's more of a medium to long term something, whereas this wave is a short term. So what is being considered and are we considering go taking a page out of Singapore's book? And now my second question is, again, to both of you all, uh, what are the numbers or how many uh, outbreaks have been noted in secondary schools? How many secondary schools have there been? COVID-19 outbreaks. Now, Dr. Hines, I know earlier this week, or was it late last week, you deferred that question to the Ministry of Education. However, the Ministry of Education is deferring that question back to you at the Ministry of Health. So any more information on that? Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's respond to the first bit of the question that you asked with respect to the increasing numbers and the planned response. Uh, you partially answered your own question, uh, but I'm going to disagree to some extent with your, uh, your assessment that the vaccination is a long-term or medium-term solution. The vaccination solution is actually an immediate-term solution because as soon as you are vaccinated and you, re you begin to reduce your risk, you as an individual improve your chances of not ending up in the hospital. You also reduce the burden on the hospital system. So that is not just medium or long term, that's actually immediate term. And as the numbers evolve, unfold, as we see the direction and the speed at which this wave uh, progresses, then the relevant information will be taken into account uh, by the decision makers in terms of what additional strategies would be taken, what additional strategies or approaches would be taken. So. That question of what will be done is really, it's preemptive to us that at this point in time, when the decision makers have uh, concluded based on the existing information, 
which direction to go in, that information will most certainly be provided from that level. And moving to the second bit of your question, now there was a bit of information that had been shared uh, with respect to numbers of cases across the board. Now it does not really specify, for example, numbers of schools, etc. And it is definitely better for the Ministry of Education to publish that particular uh, piece of info as I'm looking for it here. Publish that piece, that, that piece of info with the additional context that they have. But we do have a nice little uh, summary so far that what we will do is with the Ministry of Education's permission. Sorry? Okay. With the Ministry of Education's permission, which I understand that we do have, we can run through this and then we can uh, refer to them to host it on their website. So they put their information together a little bit differently. They have districts that we don't uh, that we don't have in our particular setting. So they have Portis Pena and Environs in George East, Northeastern, so they don't correspond directly to our counties. Nonetheless, up to November 5th, the data that they've shared with us gives number of cases reported for follow-up, number of confirmed positives, confirmed negatives, and pending uh, those primary contacts, pending confirmation. What I'll run through for the uh, sake of brevity and allow the information to be shared after that run through the confirmed positives by these districts. So for Port of Spain and Environs, there were five confirmed positives up to November 5th. For St. George East, there would be 16. For Northeastern, 12. For Carney, 3. For St. Patrick, 7. For Victoria, 5. And for Southeastern, 7. These are the confirmed positives in each of those districts. Now, the question you asked really re re reflected how many schools, et cetera, and that information wouldn't be in this, uh, this particular summary. But this is the summary that has been shared thus far, and additional detail on this can, of course, be sourced from the Ministry of Education. So I think we'd uh, leave that there for the time being and uh, undertake to share this, as it has been shared, this particular slide on our website uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. We quickly go to TV6 for your questions. Good morning. Hi, good morning to the panel. Alicia Boucher from TV6 here. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards, I'm wondering, um, what is the average time frame that it generally takes for um, persons, patients in ICU to be transferred from the traditional healthcare system into the parallel healthcare system and how is this situation affecting those who might need ICU care in the traditional healthcare system? I don't know whether or not it has begin, um, begun to have that kind of an, an impact. And my second question is for Dr. Hines. Um, for the category of persons eligible for the third primary dose, seeing that they would not have um, triggered that kind of immune response needed, and that's why they're being given that dose, does it now mean that they are not considered fully vaccinated with the two doses that they would have received before? Thank you. And oh, and I just want an update on how many um, third primary doses have been administered thus far. Okay, good morning. Thank you, Ms. Boucher. The transfer of a patient from the accident and emergency department to the intensive care unit ward is multifactorial so a bed i'm just letting i'm i just like to reiterate that a bed may be available in the parallel healthcare system but the patient may not be stable enough that is clinically stable enough to place on a portable ventilator and to have that patient moved by ambulance from an accident and emergency for example from the eric williams medical sciences complex to the coover medical and multi-training facility the time that it that uh, that the, the duration of time that is required um, varies based on the clinical status of the patient, the availability of an ambulance unit and an advanced life care support unit's ambulance, which is a higher spec ambulance, um, the availability of beds in the parallel healthcare um, system. But I'd like to reassure you that the patients in the accident and emergency departments are undergoing and receiving the same level of care that has been um, discussed 
as per the RHA's guidelines on managing persons with COVID-19 that require ICU care. So they are being treated in the isolation units or the biocontainment units of the accident and emergency departments. Your second part of the question um, was an inquiry as to whether the current situation is affecting persons in the traditional healthcare system. And I can confirm that persons are not being denied ICU care um, for non-COVID reasons in the traditional healthcare system because of the increased number of patients at this point in time. Now, that is very relevant at this point in time. The parallel healthcare system was designed, developed, and has been adapting and evolving to protect the traditional healthcare system. And as of this point in time, there are 60 operational ICU beds in Trinidad and five in Tobago. So patients continue to receive care for tra in the traditional system for non-COVID um, diagnoses, as well as the COVID-19 patients in the ENEs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Uh, we go across to Tobago now, Radio Tambrin. Actually, the second question that was oh, directed to me, and I believe that was with respect to full vaccination. And it's an interesting question, so I do want to make sure we answer it. Uh, the question was whether someone who has had their second dose and it requires an additional primary dose of, of vaccination, whether that individual would not be considered fully vaccinated. And while it is to some extent a little bit semantic, the, uh, the answer would be yes. At this point, because we have identified individuals whose sustained immune response requires an additional primary dose, until you get that additional primary dose, you wouldn't really consider yourself to be fully vaccinated. And again, this is a dynamic field, as Dr. LeBlanc pointed out, as we've said before, as the research comes through on how well your immune system responds in the first place, how well your immune system sustains that response, and how long that response can be sustained for. All of this information is then going to modify what qualifies as fully vaccinated, the frequency with which additional vaccinations may or may not be required. So that, that, that's an excellent question. It's a question that will be subject to update as additional data becomes available. It's a very good question to ask. Uh, with respect to the rollout of the additional primary dose, I don't have the exact figures in front of me. I know that they were in excess of 100 doses that had already been uh, uh, had already been distributed at my last check, but we will undertake to provide that information to the public via the, uh, via the Ministry of Health website subsequently with the exact number. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Uh, Clayton Clark, Radio Tambrin, we are ready. Okay. Okay, so next we go to Newsday, no Newsday. Good morning, everyone. Rihanna McKenzie here from Newsday. Right. Um, my, my first question is for Dr. Hines. Um, so I am hoping for a, a bit more information on a gene that has been identified um, that is said to double the risk of respiratory failure and death from COVID-19 in people with in, in people of South Asian heritage. Um, have you received any further information on this from the WHO? Um, and if so, is it a factor in the COVID-19 infection and death rate that we're seeing here? Um, my second question, um, can you provide an estimate on the number of COVID-19 cases coming out of schools as students are now back out, uh, both vaccinated and unvaccinated? I understand that the um, Education Ministry will um, be recording this info information, but um, would you consider maybe a joint briefing with the Education Ministry to address this because we are seeing some spread happening in schools. Okay, could you repeat the question? The, 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 you weren't hearing clearly at all. It's um, very, very apologize. muffled. Yes, but okay. please repeat the question. Please speak a little louder. Okay, sure. Well, which question? The first or the second question? Just the, the brief point, the, the brief question on both. What was the question in each case? And, okay, sure. Um, you're hearing me a little better now, A right? little better. Okay, so I was hoping for a bit more information. This is for Dr. Hines 
on a gene that has been identified and is said to double the risk of respiratory failure and death from COVID-19 in people of South Asian heritage. Have you received any further information from the WHO on this new development? And if so, is it a factor in the COVID-19 infection and death rates that we are seeing here? My second question, can you provide an estimate on the number of COVID-19 cases um, coming out of schools as students are now back out, both vaccinated and unvaccinated? I understand the education ministry will be recording this information, but uh, would you consider maybe a joint briefing with the education ministry to address this because we are seeing some spread happening in schools? Okay, heard the questions better this time. Thank you. So with respect to the that genetic risk, we are aware of the information. The information has been uh, has been published, but as I'm sure you are aware, we're not doing any sort of genetic screening of our population. So we can't say the extent to which that gene would or would not be present or prevalent within our own population. And therefore, we can't really estimate the extent to which that may or may not affect what we're seeing right now with regard to COVID-19 spread or with regard to the effects of the Delta variant. Uh, and again, because it is, that's more, uh, it's an interesting point, it's an academic point, it's something that may be useful for research, but it's not so much a thing that can be applied practically in the response to the, the, the health system's response to the threat of COVID-19. What can be practically applied is the additional uptake of vaccination and that regardless of your genetics that will provide you some level of risk reduction in addition to which all the other public health measures layered one on top of the other the mask wearing the hand washing the avoiding of the uh, crowded spaces the, all of those behaviors together will reduce your risk regardless of what your genetic makeup happens to be so we, we will be focusing more on those things that we can intervene on in a practical manner while taking note of the interesting academic factors around the, the genetics that have been uh, published so far. Now, with regard to the second question, you're quite right. Details of that nature would definitely be details that would be released by the Ministry of Education. We ran through uh, earlier the numbers by what they call educational districts. And as we said, we will post, post or host that slide is shared with us uh, on the website for future reference. But in terms of the numbers vaccinated versus unvaccinated, that would be for the health team that works with the Ministry of Education to provide additional detail on. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Uh, we go to azpnews.com for an additional question. Good morning again, Friar Bihari, AZP News. Um, Dr. Richards, you have said in the past that people sometimes present themselves to the e, &E when when their symptoms are very severe. There is a problem with the number of ambulances we have that, that provide that service. People are waiting hours to, to get um, their transportation to hospital. Is the ministry concerned about that? And is there any sort of plans to use the other ambulance service, for example, from, from the fire service? Um, to get people to hospital now, rather than, than only de depending on, on, on GMRTT. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Prior, for that question. The Ministry of Health continues to collaborate and work with the GMRTT service to ensure that the required number of ambulances are deployed on every shift. And of course, more ambulances are deployed on peak shifts. And we do real-time monitoring with the GMRTT um, as one as our contracted service provider in the public service. The Ministry of Health, through the regional health authorities, also uses the RHA ambulances, for example, for, for transfers between facilities. So patients would contact the 811 hotline and they would be screened and assessed. And of course, we have a clinical team that works alongside the GMRTT, that, that is doctors who are on call, um, specialists, primary care physicians, and um, persons who would be communicating with Dr. Trotman and other members of the overall clinical management team. But we additionally um, have RHA ambulances that would move patients, for example, if a patient needs to be transferred between the San Fernando General Hospital accident and emergency to the Point Fortin Hospital. 
or um, within the ERHA, from the ERHA, um, Sandy Grandi Hospital, to the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex. So we are continuing. Again, it's a demand issue. We are doing all in our part um, at the government level, the Ministry of Health level, and the RHA level. But the onus is now on the population to please reduce this demand, given the limited supply of ambulances and other resources. Reduce this demand by please becoming vaccinated. Let's take the ministry up on that offer of being vaccinated to prevent yourself from having yourself or prevent yourself or a loved one from having to contact the ambulance to be transferred to an accident and emergency. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Uh, we go to Guardian Media Limited for another follow-up question. Hey, morning again, everyone. Uh, so my follow-up question, it was part of my initial questions that I wasn't answered. But to what extent or is it even being considered locally um, to implement a similar measure as what is being implemented in Singapore, where unvaccinated people are now being asked to pay for hospital spaces? And I ask that against the backdrop of our very limited amount of um, bed spaces, especially in the ICU. Okay, thank you. You would note that I actually did answer your question by saying that any additional changes in policy would be announced by the decision makers. So we'll leave that question there. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Uh, we go across to TV6 for a follow-up follow question. Hi, good morning again. Um, so we got an update on the number of vaccinated versus unvaccinated in both the overall um, healthcare system, the parallel healthcare system, as well as ICU. And I was wondering if we can get an update on, if, if we can get an update on the number of deaths vaccinated versus unvaccinated that we've had so far. Okay, so that information is uh, info that we keep updating basically on a daily basis. Uh, we have to go back through records, uh, sometimes go back and verify uh, vaccination status, vaccination cards, etc. In the newest sets of deaths, we're actually planning to update that particular statistic at the next Saturday conference. So give us until then to have the newest set of information uh, verified, uh, which does require us to sometimes go back to the record or ask the doctors to send additional information so that we can verify the actual vaccination status of the newer set before we update that statistic. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. We, and we have come to the end of today's media conference. Remember that we all have an important role to play in protecting Trinidad and Tobago from COVID-19. Keep making the responsible decisions to follow the health guidelines, including wearing a mask, washing your hands, social distancing, and of course, let's vaccinate TNT. Goodbye for now. Good day, TNT. My name is Miss Isabel Julian, and I am urging the public to please go out there and take the vaccine I have taken the vaccine. I have no complication. I have no problem. In order for us to get herd immunity, we have to take the vaccine. I have my grandson home. I have my son, my children home. I would not like to carry the virus home and infect anyone. I am begging you TNT. We have the frontline workers, the nurses, the doctors, they are all doing their part since 2020. Let's vaccinate TNT.